I have a PhD in education I got when I was in Kansas uh, six years ago. And I've been doing balloon sats in education. Probably my dissertation was using balloon sats and experimenting with their effect on attitude towards science, and I'm still doing that. So I'll talk a little bit about how I'm actually doing uh, near space with education. And that was that my first slide. Yeah. OK. OK. Uh, so, so far I've done three flights for schools, uh, Bellevue, Richland, and Boise. So the first two out of Washington State, the days that I did those. Uh, the third one is out of my school district. I teach AP chemistry. And at the end of their chemistry test, the AP test, students don't want to do anything else in school anymore. So I gave them a balloon set project to work on. So we actually did some science in the classroom for the last two weeks of school when they were sick and tired of studying and taking their test. The next three are, are uh, flights I'm going to be doing. So I will be leaving Saturday. will not be able to join you for lunch. I will be driving back to Idaho in a day and a half so that on Monday I can start Ace Academy and start my next balloon set. I'm a road warrior. Um, I'm going to start the school year during the fall. I will start a balloon sat club for my school. And then also, we're trying to do something with community education. Where's that school at? Okay, so this is the school is the Treasure Valley Math and Science Center. It's in, in Boise, Idaho. And it is a high school designed specifically for math and science students. Okay, so Bellevue, Washington, we did three flights during spring break, and these were three simultaneous launches for Washington. This is the Bellevue School District, it's a junior high. And we were, uh, had students build balloon sets. And I'm going to show, I'll pass around an example. It's a kit that I had designed. This is the same kit that I used for my dissertation. This is an example of a balloon set. The only thing that could come out probably is the battery. So just be careful as you pass it around. But this is an example of a balloon set that they had designed. Uh, the electronics inside, they have to solder this, program this. Two sensors get connected. The sensors reside underneath a white cap to keep the sun from shining on them. So you're getting valid data, so temperature data. Rather than getting the temperature sensor exposed to the sun and giving a bad value, we have the white cap to protect it. Uh, camera, camera can be positioned anywhere. The camera is operated by the flight computer. Battery pack that goes in there. Hand warmer, we recommend a hand warmer for the battery and the camera, kind of keep things a little bit warmer. And then a commit tag, you pull this off to start recording data. That way, if you plug the battery in half an hour before the flight, you don't get half an hour's worth of data on the ground. It's like, yes, I know it's 78 degrees on the ground. What do I care about that? So right before you launch, you pull the tag. Uh, that way also, when you launch the balloon set, if you see the tag hanging off as the balloon set goes up, you know you've, you're hosed. So. You can jump and grab it. That's right, grab it quick. So uh, this was uh, the first two balloon chains are ready to go up. So we've got our tracking modules ready to go, redundant tracking modules here, and then the student balloon sets here. Um, and again, the balloon sets are designed just like the example I'm passing around right here. Uh, what's really nice is that this is Bellevue, Washington, so Seattle, Washington. This is Pinky Nelson, shuttle astronaut from the 80s, who actually was there to help us launch and fill the balloon. His daughter is one of the teachers. So it's really cool to have an astronaut come in and help the students build their balloon sets. And here we are filling the balloon. This is Washington State, mid-state Washington. It was very foggy that morning, so no blue skies. Yeah, kind of typical. Uh, this is one of the balloons ready to go up. Again, no wind. This was radiation fog, so it was very calm. No wind, not, uh, so foggy but windless. We could do a ladder launch, raise the balloon one step at a time. Uh, the balloon is kind of disappearing into the fog here, but a recovery parachute, tracking modules, and the balloon sats that are going up. We we're able to, to uh, get everything ready to go. One student holding the last capsule. All three balloons about 100 feet apart between the balloons in a triangle. Give a countdown, five, four, three, two, one, release, let them go, watch them take off for about 30 seconds before they disappear. Uh, the data the that the students collected, so uh, they had their choice of two sensors. So you got three sensors, pick two. They could measure temperature, could be temperature inside and outside of the capsule. They could measure relative humidity of the air, or they could measure light intensity. The light intensity uses an LED photometer, so it's sensitive to the color of the, of the LED itself. So infrared, blue, green, red, yellow. Measured the light intensity in, in, in one of those color, uh, color bands. Also gave them APERS data so that I could give them the time of the flight, the altitude of the flight, and the wind speed. Their data that they got collected data once a minute, so they, were, they didn't have the altitude. But if they combine that with my APERS data, then they could produce a graph of, say, air temperature as a function of altitude, and then measure this transition when you get into the stratosphere. 
What's really cool about this is you can teach students that the, the troposphere, the lowest layer of the atmosphere, gets colder as you go up because you're getting away from the source of heat, which is the Earth's surface. And then once you get into the stratosphere, you're getting into the ozone layer. And the ozone, uh, the ozone layer, since that blocks ultraviolet radiation, that energy cannot be destroyed. This can be converted into thermal. So we start getting warmer. You can teach a student that. They can take a test, and the next week they're going to forget it. But if they actually put this data together, they're going to see this transition, especially if you don't tell them this is going to happen. They know. As I go up in the mountains, it gets colder. Let them run the flight, the data, program, and plot this all out, and then just see this transition. This would be a discrepant event. They don't expect to see that happen. They'll go into understanding what's going on here. Ten years from, ten years from now, they'll, they can tell you, oh, we get into the stratosphere around 40 to 50,000 feet, and it starts getting warmer there. They're going to remember that. So it's a really nice experiment for them to work with. What did it bottom out at, Paul? So we went down to about minus 70 here. And again, so, uh, this was Fahrenheit. Oh, oh. Uh, Fahrenheit. So yeah, I'm, I'm, yes, it's science. It should be Celsius. But anyhow, <laughs> um, yeah, I do, I do Fahrenheit only because I'm more accustomed to Fahrenheit. I mean, I teach science. We do Celsius. I have a feeling for Celsius, but I have a better feel for what Fahrenheit is like. So I plot this out with, in, in the Fahrenheit temperature scale. And if you have them do this experiment year, you know, month after month, several months, you'll find that the transition occurs at different temperatures. So it's a little bit warmer in the summertime and a little bit higher in the summertime, colder and lower in the wintertime. They can see this, this transition uh, from, over the course of the year. Uh, here's the three flights that we did. We all plotted them out, launched at the same time. Uh, these two flights were pretty typical. This, I don't know why this made 108,000 feet, but that's good. I mean, these are practice because they're only, they're less than 100,000 feet, you know, but this is good. That's 100,000 feet. Uh, so the three flights, these landed outside of a small town in Washington state, and we had um, hundred, about uh, over 100 students and parents show up. And we swarmed into this town in several cars. We probably doubled the population of that town. It was amazing to get in there. Now, three of them had landed, so we had to divide into three groups and go get all go get our capsules back. Um, so, over 100 parents, 100 parents and students. Uh, the students were junior high students. They went with their parents, or they went with teachers. Uh, so they weren't traveling with strangers, and the parent, the students were with adult supervision. Uh, so it was it was safe for them to bring them along. Um, and we sent up 20 balloon sets, three balloons. 20 balloon sets total. The balloon sets had to be no more than one pound, so we were able to put them all, all onto uh, three balloons. Uh, Steve Allen, one of my friends in Idaho, uh, built a, one of the balloon sets was his. Uh, he had a camera on board, and because we launched them all together, we got, were able to get a picture of one of the balloons, one of the stacks as, as we're lifting out, uh, just clearing the clouds. So the balloon, 20 feet of load line, parachute, tracking modules, and then all the balloon sets. Uh, we've gotten pictures of balloons before, but usually it's way off in the distance as a little dot. But this happened just because we launched them all at the same time. We're taking pictures every minute on the way up. So we, just, just, we were able to get into position to get a picture of the balloon going up. So kind of interesting to see the shape of the balloon. You're going up where air is pushing down on the balloon. It's kind of squashing it down a little bit. But able, we're going straight up. What altitude? This would be, this cloud, this is a fog bank, so we're probably talking Two, three thousand feet max. This is shortly after launch. Uh, the, the fog bank was fairly low, so right after. I mean, after this, the balloons are start drifting apart, and you won't get you won't get pictures like this. Has to be right after launch. Okay, so we've got a video ready to play here. Um, we knew this would happen. I mean, it works on my PC, but you take it from a jump drive to another location, and the video doesn't work. So I'm going to run the video real quick. And this is a video camera looking down while we're launching. And it's a 30 seconds long. It's just a real quick clip of the, of the launch itself. People who are concerned about hydrogen, we would have the students actually step away from the balloon. But it would be nice, though, that once, if it's a ladder launch, so it's not a Hail Mary launch, but a ladder launch where there's no wind, we'd like to have a student at the very end holding that last balloon sat. And they have the countdown, and they get a chance to release this thing, have this thing take off, it'd be really cool. 
Okay, uh, several teachers were involved, Karen Barkley being one of them. I'd ask for, you know, so what's this effect on your students? Now I'm actually measuring results. I have a survey that I'll use, but this is a comment I got from her. So in terms of how well the kids are doing in science, she's a science teacher, here's one of the things I can tell you. I've observed several kids that I teach that are also in satellites. That's the name of their club, the Satellites Club. Exhibit more confidence in class when we talk, uh, when we discuss inquiry processes, hypothesis variables, and validity and procedures. So the students are more comfortable talking about the process of science because they're actually doing a science experiment. They have to design this device. They have to uh, collect data and make some predictions about what they think the data would look like and analyze it. So students are getting more confident just talking and dealing with science when they're, when they're, when they're doing a project like this. So it's a really nice impact for them. And they actually get to see an experiment that's not cookbook because it's not a confirmation lab. Oh, I expect if I mix these two chemicals together, it's going to turn green. This is, I don't know for sure what's going to happen. Here's what I think might happen. We'll design an experiment. Let's interpret the data. So it's very open-ended. Uh, what I use on my survey is a, is, a, is a survey called TASRA. It measures attitude towards science. And I will measure seven different attitudes towards science. The way this has to work is that we have students who are building balloon sats and students who are not building balloon sats. We give them a survey at the beginning. This is a pre-survey, pre-program, sur or pre-project survey. And we'll measure atti seven attitudes towards science. It's a 70 question questionnaire. And they have to answer on a scale of one to five how they feel about different, different aspects of science. Uh, for each of those attitudes, there's 10 questions. Five of them are written in a positive sense. Five of them are written in a negative sense. And then we can also kind of correlate how they answered. If they answered the same way on, on this attitude, we know we're measuring how they actually feel about these different attitudes. Um, so we've done those surveys. I've got to finish entering the data into a spreadsheet. Uh, the students are doing post surveys right now as we're speaking. They've done these flights. They've analyzed their data. They're going to get the same questionnaire. They'll take the answer to the same questions. We'll look at those results, compare the results before and after for students who are the control group and the experimental group. Use a program called SPSS. It's a statistics program that lets us look at this data. And we'll see what kind of differences doing a balloon set project has on students versus uh, not doing the balloon set project. Two years ago when I did this for my dissertation, I found that the attitude towards science as a, as a science or hobby activity, like you would rock collect or take a telescope out, that attitude towards science as a hobby activity went up by 3%. That doesn't sound a lot, but in, when you're doing science education, anything, if you can bring up a couple percent and you can show that you've got a couple percent increase, that's a good thing. So it's not powerful, but it's still considered to be a strong result that students' attitude towards science as a hobby activity does increase. Uh, what's really nice about that is these students then are more likely to get telescopes and look at the stars at the night or do rock collecting or bug collecting or something like that. Changing your attitude towards science as a hobby activity makes you more inclined to do science in the, in the, in the classroom. If you do some more science in the classroom and you're interested in doing science in the classroom, you're more likely to work harder, to be more successful, which brings up your grades. And so the uh, grades in science also go up because you've learned more because you're willing to put the time and the effort into learning the science. So it's good that we're, we're impacting that part of, these, of their attitude towards science. We want to show in the future with other surveys, it won't be TOS or it'll be something different. We want to actually look at the next generation science standards, which combine science and engineering together and actually find questionnaires and find out what students have learned doing the balloon sap project. So that'll be a future project. But right now, it's can we just show that the attitude towards science changes? And the concern about doing a project like this is do we have enough data? To make this valid, I need about 111 students involved in the project, and I'm not sure if I have that many students or not. If I don't, this will be another practice, and we'll do it again next year trying to get more students roped in. One way we get students roped in is that we did a launch for Richland, Washington. This is the Tri-Cities uh, area of Washington, more central, south central Washington. We got some more students involved. Try to keep expanding and pushing the program further and further out. Let more teachers know about the program so we get more students involved. This launch was for a uh, school. It's, um, it's kind of a charter school for students who aren't doing that well academically. It's not a last chance for them. It's just that these students have not done that well. Here's another opportunity for them to be involved in school. In this science class, the science teacher I had actually had them build the balloon set. So this was a good opportunity for the students to, to actually get a second chance to excel at doing science. And they, and they love doing this experiment. So we did this launch. Uh, there's only uh, about uh, 20 students involved in this one. Smaller number of balloon sets, but it was their first time to do it. 
and they found out about this because of the first group presented at a teacher's conference in Washington State. She heard about this and said, okay, how do I get involved with this? And she got her students involved. So another flight we did for uh, Mid-State Washington. This case here, we had only about 20 parents and students involved. Again, smaller number, only four balloon sets. It's not, it's not surprising we have fewer people involved. And this one made 91,000 feet. Uh, really nice on this one, too, is that we had a big return back on the flight. We went up and actually came back a significant distance, so we didn't land as far away. On this one here, we were at a small town. I made a prediction where the balloon was going to come down based on its descent rate and the wind speed. And I said, good, we go about a mile this way, we should be close to the balloon. So we got out of town, waited there. We could see the balloon parachute about a mile north of us going back to town. So we had to turn around, go back to town, go north to go pick it up. So much for my prediction. And I'm supposed to be an expert at this. Um, the sec third one was for Boise, Idaho. This is my AP chemistry class. This is Bucky the dinosaur contemplating the world at 90,000 feet. Uh, this, this student group, they had sent up two temperature sensors, internal, external temperature. And in this case here, they had Bucky the dinosaur, plastic dinosaur. They mounted him to the out, I assume it's a him, a him to the outside of the balloon set. And they took a picture of Bucky on the edge of the earth. Again, made about 90,000, made 90,000 feet. I was able to collect some data, analyze the data. Since this was a chemistry class, I wanted them to do something with chemistry in the atmosphere. So their secondary goal was to release sulfates in the stratosphere. Now, if you follow the global uh, this, uh, climate change uh, debate on how we're going to handle this, I mean, first off, you've got some extreme people who say it don't happen. But go to the 97% of the scientists who say this is really happening. What do we do to counteract global warming? I mean, there's issues that involve money, um, financing, and there's some, some serious issues on how you're going to address this. One of the ways that they're thinking about possibly addressing it is if you release sulfates into the stratosphere. Once you're in the stratosphere, small particles don't rain down because there's no weather up there. They will stay in the atmosphere. Sulfates are from little tiny drops. They're very white and reflective. They have a high, high albedo, and they reflect sunlight. So if you release sulfates in the stratosphere, light, some sunlight, some small percentage of sunlight never makes it to the surface to warm the, to warm the Earth. It actually gets reflected back into space. Now, is this, a, is this a, a, a way that we really want to solve global warming or not? I'm not going to debate that. I'm just asking, can we engineer something to do that? So students were talking about how they might release sulfates in the atmosphere. The one experiment they did run is they put water in a water balloon, in a balloon. So they sent a water balloon. The idea is that the balloon would expand, it would burst, the water falls out. That represents our sulfates. Uh, the idea is we're hacking the stratosphere. And I like that term, we're going to hack the stratosphere. But that would release sulfates in the atmosphere. That would be one way to do it. Uh, we found out, though, is that a water balloon does not expand. An air balloon expands. Water does not expand in a vacuum. So what we need to do next time is put in a small amount of water and lots of air. Uh, so they sent a water balloon up, came down, and it was just fine. Then I'm ready to hang the balloon set up on our ceiling. I drop it, and the balloon breaks. So we did not burst in near space, but we did, drop, we did burst when I dropped it on the ground. Uh, so that, that's something we'll do next time, uh, next year. And I'd like to find some other sensors we could send up to measure the composition of the atmosphere. And I'll have to do some experimenting to see what we can do with that. But that would be an opportunity for my AP chemistry students to do some kind of chemistry uh, open-ended experiment. OK, uh, we had only about 15 parents and students attend this launch. Again, it's only it's one class, three, three sets of students, six balloon sats, three belonging to the students, three belonging to adults who are not part of the class. And we made 90,000 feet. 35-mile launch, really nice as we launched from north of Boise. Um, we were in a small town called Cuna, looking up at the balloon. We watched it burst, and then landed south of the Boise airport, and it landed only a mile away from us. So it was a really great launch. It didn't go very far. And we could track it through the entire flight, and we were there to see the thing come down. OK, oops. Now, when I get back, I'm going to go to Ace Academy. Ace Academy is run by the Department of Transportation. It's the Aeronautical Division. And this is a one-week summer camp for junior high students, introducing them to aviation careers. Uh, so they're going to get airplane rides. They're going to go to the airport. They're going to see airplanes. But we're also going to have them do a balloon set project. So on Monday morning, I'm going to get home Sunday night, pack, unpack the car, repack the car, go to bed, get up in the morning, and I'm ready to hit this again. But we're going to have about five student teams designing balloon sets. And again, the same style that I'm just showing you that I'm passing around right here, they're going to spend the morning, half a day building the balloon sat. They're not going to program it. It's going to be pre-programmed. They just need to build the airframe, plug in the flight computer, plug in the sensors, and I'll tell them how it's going to work. And then we'll test it on Thursday, or excuse me, on Tuesday. 
put it inside of a dry ice chamber, we'll uh, get it cold, chilly, and collect some data and watch them download their data. And then Wednesday morning, we launch, chase, recover. I get their data downloaded, get the data back, data back to the students, because they're gonna be building model rockets, launching them, and then doing another activity on Thursday. So this is gonna be a really quick, have them build this thing, launch it, chase. They'll be able to track it while they're on, on their field trips, because they'll have their cell phones, and we've got eye gates in Idaho. At least one, eye gate in Idaho. <laughs> Plus, once you get up high enough, we'll hit, we'll hit uh, Salt Lake City. Uh, so, but they'll actually be able to track. They won't act, go on the launch itself, because they're just jam-packed with activities during this, this, uh, su this summer camp. So expect about four adults to be involved. Uh, the students won't be there. We expect at least 85,000 feet. That's a typical altitude. Six balloon sats going up. Oops. Six balloon sats going up. And, uh, and again, it's a really rapid two-day turnaround. Build this thing, launch it, chase, and then uh, they're on to something else. Uh, Near Space Explorers Club. Uh, the parents really liked the balloon sat launch that we did for their, for their chemistry students. And I did run a science club last year at school, and I had to find different activities for the, for the students to do. Well, I think this year, I'm gonna change that. I'm not gonna go looking for activities. I know an activity. We're gonna do balloon sats. So I'm actually gonna have a, balloon, a Near Space Explorers Club. We'll develop T-shirts, and they're gonna actually meet once a week. And we're gonna do at least four flights. And we're gonna give them some lessons, plus they're gonna write reports. The reports will be written according to the American Institute of Aeronautics and, and Astronautics. They uh, publish, they do uh, uh, presentations. We're going to write the reports the same way that, that they require them to be written. 26 lessons, and let me go ahead and pass two of these out. I will pass these around. This shows you the 26 lessons that we're going to use and something about the flights that we're going to do. So I'll pass these two around so you can look at those. So experiment or lessons like, you know, where is near space? What is near space? Uh, how to build an airframe, how to run flight predictions, what affects the flights, you know, ascent rates is governed by the lift, the drag of the balloon, where, the, and then where we're going depending on the wind direction and wind speeds. We'll, we'll talk about these factors and how to make the, predict how to make the predictions about where the balloon's going to come down at. And students will actually start making these predictions. Uh, different types of sensors that we can use, how to analyze your data using a spreadsheet, how to use Microsoft uh, Movie Maker and, and Microsoft Paint. So using Microsoft Paint and Movie, you can actually analyze film clips and images for the colors. So it's actually science you can do with these really simple programs. And of course, Microsoft Excel. We plan at least four balloon flights, probably more like six. The first one being a real quick introduction. To, here's how we do a balloon launch, and we're going to send up paper airplanes. We'll use a mesh bag, uh, like wedding veil material. Everybody will build paper airplanes, put them inside this bag, bring the lines up to the balloon, tie one to the neck of the balloon. The other three get tied to loops, and then you shove a balloon through them. And you, and you basically have a balloon to hold those three uh, cords of the, of the sack up to the balloon. The main balloon goes up. The toy balloon expands and bursts first. When it bursts, the three lines fall away, and the, and the, par the par paraplanes will fall out. And we'll send up a tracking module with a video camera watching down. We should see the balloon expand, expand, burst, and, airplanes and airplane, paper airplanes fly away. That is a really quick launch. You know, they don't have to learn to build anything. All they need to do is fold a paper airplane, and I guarantee my students can do that. I get them in my classrooms every once in a while. <laughs> so they got paper airplanes, and they can test, they can build their airplanes, and we'll launch them at somewhere around 15, 20,000 feet before the balloon bursts. Uh, we want to do a video flight where they'll actually learn to build the airframe itself, and we're just going to videotape an experiment. So it's a passive exposure experiment. But by using Microsoft Movie Maker, we can look at the time, frame to frame to frame, when did this happen? You can take film clips and then put them into Microsoft Paint, and you can actually measure the number of pixels. So if something's expanding, you can actually count pixels to get the size of this. If you're looking at the horizon, you can use the eyedropper and actually get the color in red, green, and blue of different parts of say, the horizon at different altitudes above the horizon. So you can do some really simple passive experiments using, these, using these, the, this data. Then we're going to teach them electronics, and they're actually going to get a chance to burn their fingers by learning to solder. And we're going to program. So we're going to program in basic uh, using the pickaxe. Since it's programmed in basic, the learning curve is really shallow. It's not like going to see where the learning curve is like this. Uh, so they'll actually start collecting data using a flight computer. Uh, we'd like to do advanced experiments, uh, larger experiments. We will uh, make a transatlantic attempt. And I need to talk a little bit about that, but we have a sponsor to help us out. Southern California has done it twice. They had great success, but they're further south than us. So they landed in the Med and in North Africa. We think if we do this from Idaho, we're more likely to go across to more Europe, Central Europe. So we're going to try our attempt. We're looking for sponsors for that. And then an integrated mission. I've got a BloomSat um, Extreme flight computer that has a lot of 
uh, ports for sensors and it's got more memory. When NASA designs a spacecraft, different organizations build the different sensors and they get integrated into a single payload. So we'd like to simulate that with a larger flight computer. Students have to design their individual experiments and then integrate it into a single experiment where everybody's got to work together. How are we going to program and collect the data? So that'll be the, the attempt we're going to do with that. And real quickly, we pass this one around too. This is an article we did for the balloon launch in uh, Washington. So one of those was Washington State. So that's like what we're planning to do for this class. Community education. Last year, we did a robotics class. We taught six families how to build robots. That was back uh, last year, April, May of last year. We actually had robot kits. And these people are, you know, they have probably never touched a soldering iron. They may have never programmed before. But in four weeks, we had them building robots and driving them around. We're going to try to do the same thing again this time for the fall of 2014. But this time, we want to do a balloon set and take about six families, provide them with a balloon set kit. And the kit is like this. I'll pass this around. This is a balloon sack kit. And they will actually have uh, six weeks to design a balloon sack. We'll teach them the electronics, all the procedures involved with that. And then I do a balloon launch for them. So the goal is to, is to get more families exposed to science by building a balloon sack. Uh, bonus topics. I want to talk about a couple of the topics real quick related to education. So tethering balloon sats. If you've done balloon sats before, I'll talk real quickly how I do these and I'll show the tools. So first off, the tether line. I use tough line. This is a, a very strong um, fishing line to, to tether balloon sats together. So I'll pass that around. So that's the material we use. I use four strands of that tough line. Uh, we use a tether hook, and this goes through the balloon sets. So if you look at my balloon sets, you'll see there's four tubes that are glued into the tube, the plastic tubes. The cords go through those tubes. To get those, the cords through, we use a little wire hook on a handle. We shove this through the tube. The hook picks up the loop on the cord, and we can pull it through the balloon set. So I'll pass this around also. Please don't hook yourself. It's piano wire, but please don't hook yourself with the little hook at the end. Not as dangerous as a fish hook, but please do be careful. But that's our tool to, add to uh, pull the, the cords through the balloon set. Uh, the tubes themselves, they're plastic tubes. Uh, this is this, the material here. These we picked up from Hobby Lobby. These are balloon tubes. So rather than filling a balloon with gas, you fill it with just regular air. You can put it on the stick, and you can walk with your balloon up in the air. So the plastic tubing, 20-inch uh, links. You can buy about 20 of those in a bag for about 3 or $4. So it's good material to work with. It's fairly long. It works for the balloon sets. And you'll see the example here. I actually put them into the walls of the airframe. We don't put it in the center of the airframe, because if you put it in the center of the airframe, you've got this tube in the middle. You can't put experiments around. We actually embed them into the walls. That strengthens them. Plus, if we have four cords coming to the four corners of the balloon set, there's less twisting. There's a little more resistance to spinning. So your camera pictures tend to be less, less uh, blurry. And your video tends to be less nauseating, because you're not doing that, that rapid spinning. <laughs> Uh, tether knots, we just take the cord. I do a double overhand knot. I'm not, I am a Boy Scout, but I am a failed Boy Scout. I cannot tie knots. But I take the cord, and I basically double it over, tie an overhand knot, and that's plenty strong. And we use a, a meter stick or, or a yardstick if you're American. We measure 30 inches, fold the line, do our next knot. Bring the knot up to the top of the yardstick, go another 30 inches, fold, pinch there, tie another knot, and tie it up. So we can tie knots every 30 inches or so. And we drag those through the balloon sats. And we do that, you'll see that the uh, cord goes through the tube in the balloon set. We hook the cord, and we can pull it through. And once we pull it through, we then put a split ring on the end. And we do that for the other four corners. So we have balloon set after balloon set after balloon set, four cords running through the four corners, four cords through the four corners, split rings on each one of those every 30 inches. The balloon sets can slide up and down a little bit, but they can't fall out. You've got the split rings. I've never had a cord break, but if a cord breaks, I've got three more to make sure that we don't, we don't lose anything. Now, the first time I did a balloon sat launch, uh, the there's a professor who used metal pipe through the center of the balloon sat, so it made it unnecessarily heavier. Plus, the metal pipe started to grate and started to rub on the cord. So we launched about six balloon sets, but we came back with three. The cord had cut, and we lost the balloon sets. But we used the plastic tubes, four cords, split rings like this, they're going to go up and you won't lose them. Plus, they'll be less spinning. So it's a really convenient way to do balloon sets. Um, second topic is near space and again. I'm trying to design test equipment for balloon sets and, and flight computers. So the first thing I designed was a GPS simulator. You plug it into an APERS tracker. 
It sends out GPS data that simulates the balloon going up to altitude, including Hank's knee. I've got that in there. And the fact that the balloon bursts and comes out fast to start with and then decreases and, and uh, you know, slows down as it gets down lower and lower to the ground. So that's a good way to test your, how your balloon set responds to altitude changes. What I'm trying to do now is, is actually simulate near space. So I've got a totable thermal vacuum chamber and a thermometer I've had to design for that. So the th totable thermal vacuum chamber uses a pressure cooker and uh, you can get them again uh, since it's after the Boston Marathon bombing. People aren't asking questions anymore. But I get a pressure cooker because I know it can, it can take the pressure pushing out. So I'm assuming it can take the pressure pushing in. And you really think about it, it's only 15 PSI pushing in on, on the pressure cooker anyways, but it's a metal can. It goes inside of a Playmate cooler. This is a, 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 a um, ice box you can put your put foods into. Since it's a metal can, we can pack dry ice inside of here on the outside of the can and get the, get the temperature of the, of the can down to about minus 40 degrees. I drill a hole, put in a uh, hose and a barb in the back to pump the air out. My new design though, I'm actually gonna take this hose and put it through the front. I find that when I put it into the can, I can't get a good seal and I leak air. But if I take the plastic, drill a hole, tap it for the threads, and then goober up the, 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 uh, the little barb with um, Loctite, we can put it in there and get an airtight seal. So from here on, on in, we'll actually we'll pump the air from the plastic itself. We used acrylic the first time, now we're gonna get away from acrylic and use other plastic that if it fails, it just fails more gracefully. Acrylic can shatter, but we'll use some uh, the, more of the ballistic type plastics. Then they're not gonna shatter. They'll crack, but they won't shatter. Pump the air out using a, a pressure uh, vacuum pump you get from, uh, from uh, Harbor Freight, about $70. Hook up a, a, vacuum, pressure, a vacuum sensor to it, get that from a, a just a, like an auto supply shop. And you end up with a totable thermal vacuum chamber. Put your stuff in there, put the balloon set inside, pump it down. Now the problem I have with this is getting the temperature. You don't find thermometers that go down to minus 90 degrees. So I've designed one now, and this is a, so I'll pass this around also, it runs off a battery. It uses a pickaxe and a temperature sensor. It can be as precise as you need it to be. You just need to adapt the code. If, if the temperature sensor is a little bit off, you just adapt, it's a software solution to fix that. But a pickaxe 28, two LED display, red and blue LEDs. So if it's a positive 99, if the red LED goes on, it goes down below zero, the blue LED goes on. So here we had a temperature of, you can hardly see it, but the flash you can't see it, but seven, positive 78 degrees. Throw this in the vacuum chamber and you can actually watch the temperature change and it'll show you the temperature of the, of, the, of the interior of the vacuum chamber. And it gets down to minus 99 degrees Fahrenheit. It also has a memory chip so that I can store the data and you can say, hey, I want to program, I want to get data once a minute, once a second, once every 10 seconds, whatever you want, just change the code. What's the temperature sensor? Okay, temperature sensor is an LM335. And we've done those, those are good down to minus 40, but I've sent them up in the near space, we've gone down to minus 60 and the temperature continues to gradually decrease with the temperature sensor. It doesn't do this abrupt failure. So this temperature sensor appears to work fine to about minus, I mean, theoretically it should work to zero, but you know, electronics won't do that. Is it a linear curve at the low end? It's, it's, it's all linear. It's, uh, the, the electronics are designed is it produces a 10 millivolts for every Kelvin, every change in one Kelvin. So it's a nice temperature. Yeah, you'll know if you're failing, if suddenly the readings stop getting linear and they start getting glitchy. But we get down to minus 60, we get nice smooth data. So um, I'm pretty confident we can get down to minus 60, no problem with this. So I'll pass this around. But it also has an analog port. So if you have a, a sensor, uh, some kind of a sensor or experiment inside, you can hook it into here. You can record this voltage also, and then monitor your temperature, record that, plus your readings from, your, from whatever device you plugged into here. So this is my... So the sensor is located right here at the top. Oh, LM3. you have it on your electronics? It's all right on the electronics itself, that's right. So it is all standalone, just and it has two bolts in the bottom so it stands up, plug the nine volt battery in the back, and you're ready to record. And then when you're done, what you can do is flip this to the download position, having this hooked up to a PC, and it'll download your data. Uh, what pressure can you get down to? I get down to about, um, depends on the, Depends on the vacuum pump itself. I've gotten down to, to less than 10, you know, to 90% 90, 90 vacuum or better. So that means the equivalent of 100,000 feet? Uh, we have to get down to 99 to get to 100,000 feet. So we can get down to anywhere from 50 to 100,000 feet equivalent. Okay, thanks. So we can get, we get, get near space. Now again, it depends on your vacuum pump. The better the quality of the vacuum pump, the lower pressure you can go to. 
So that's the thermal vacuum chamber. So that, that gives me a GPS simulator, a way to chill things, and to also record the data and see what's going on. This is the schematic if you want to build one, or I've got one here if you want to build the kit. I've got a kit if you'd like to build one. I've got one here. Come talk to me offline, and I'll, I'll show you how to do it. But this is how I did it. What I was really proud with on this circuit is I have one I.O. pin going to two different LEDs, one connected to 5 volts, one connected to ground. And by making this pin either high or low, I can turn on one or the other LEDs. I, didn't, I had to experiment to see if that would work. And that's really nice to be able to do that with the uh, with uh, using only one LED to just t tell me if we got a positive or negative voltage, or a positive or negative temperature. Okay, last thing is I'm getting ready to start a, a, a 501c3. I have a friend in Idaho, Steve Allen, who is a who works for the Tax Commission. Uh, so we've, we're we're figuring out how to get this stuff done, but we're going to start a, pro, a, a, a company called a 501c3 corporation called Nearseer in uh, uh, Nseer is going to there should be an S in there anyhow Nseer is going to design um, STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics products. Starting with near space, I will be the president and I will be the near space evangelist, uh, trying to pass the word out about near space. But we're going to try to make them available to students, also non-traditional students. So homeschoolers, for instance, boys clubs, girls, uh, boy scouts, those kind of things. So not just, not just public schools, but private schools and other school type organizations where they're teaching people, and not just uh, students, but also adults and make these products available to them. Um, we'll be a 501c3. We're going to, because we're, we're a, a nonprofit, we still can spend money. So we'll encourage support for people to help us chase and launch the, and chase after these balloons by paying them for their gas and, and whatnot and for their lunch to help us chase after it. And also we'll um, encourage people to donate money so we can make kits available at a lower, lower price to, to organizations who would like to build these balloon sets. So by being a 501c3 allows us to do this. That's going to be our big push. Um, when we start doing the lessons on how to do balloon sets, a, lesson, uh, some, a, a specific lesson plan will look something like this, or PowerPoint will look like this. We'll talk about here's how you solder. Here's here are the two things to do with the solder, the kind of tools that you need. We'll show pictures, how to do the solder, diagrams of what happens when you solder, uh, what so good solder joints look like. Oops. So that's what some of our lessons are PowerPoints. We're going to provide these PowerPoints. We'll put videos out, but our PowerPoints will look something like that. And we want to tell people to go out and do some near space. So let me finish up real quick with two last things we're talking about. Uh, number one is 3D printing is starting to be a big deal. Um, you can get a 3D printer now. The, uh, the DaVinci version 1 is now out, $500. They're trying to make a desktop, take it home like you do a printer, like you do a color printer at home. So I did a little RHAB, uh, little RHAB in plastic. I'll pass this around. But we're trying to make 3D parts and tell students how to design 3D parts that you can use for balloon sets. So that's an example of a 3D part that I printed at home. And then last thing is uh, CubeSats are another big deal in colleges where you can design your own satellites and get them launched. Those kits are probably about $75,000. So I'm trying to work on a design for a CubeSat kit that's not space rated, but you can actually build in a high school or junior high practice making your first satellite. It won't get launched, but you can at least practice making satellite using the same technology they do on CubeSats. So I'll pass this around. This is an example of a CubeSat kit that I'm working on designing to make available for schools. Basically, it's, it's the same size, same weight, has the same characteristics as a balloon sat. It's just a lot cheaper because it's not space rated and ready to go into space. And with that, I encourage everybody, let's do some near space. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer questions. Yeah, okay, uh, yeah, so NEARSYS, um, N-E-A-R-S-Y-S, so it just stands for Near Space Systems, N-E-A-R-S-Y-S, at gmail.com. Or you can go to NEARSYS.com uh, um, .com to my website. If you are a teacher and you want to get science data available to the students, if you go to my website, go under uh, Amateur Radio High Altitude Ballooning, Past Flight Data, I have data from my last 130 flights, and you can take a look, get the spreadsheets, and you've got data for temperature, altitude, Geiger counter, you know, cosmic ray counts. Uh, you can get all the data. It's just go and download, take it, whatever that data you would like, and make that available. But for uh, kits and all that, just go to nearsys.com or email me. On, on their projects where you've got schools doing these flights, right. uh, are they 
are they integrating that into the curricula or are they, they clubs? Okay. So, so the question is how the school is using this. Um, the Bellevue School District is doing it as a science club. So it's an after school science club, the Satellites Club. They're doing it after school. The Richland School did it as part of a science curriculum. Uh, the teacher is having them actually do some engineering and science experiments. So it's a part of a science uh, project in class that they have to do. And they, and they are required to write a report afterwards. Uh, so we would, we'd like to make it available as a club, as actual, actually developed curriculum. You can download your PowerPoints are there. Plus, we would go out to teachers and actually sit down with them and show them how to do this stuff. Or even go to the classroom and help the, the students do it themselves. We're just finding a lot of public education groups that are pretty hard to break into as far as teaching. That's right, yeah. It's tough, yeah if, they've got a, if they've got a designed curriculum, it's tough to bring in something new and say, here, here's a really neat project for you to do. So the two approaches we have, uh, number one is go to teacher conferences and show them, here's what we got, here's what we're doing, here's the kind of things that, that, we're, that we're making happen, and we can make these kits available for you at, with, at a discount. You know, we've got these sponsors, they're going to be available for you know, $50 rather than $250 or something like that. So try to get through teachers that way. But also go to conferences where teachers are taking classes or talking to each other about curriculum in services, for instance, and show them what we can do. Uh, the other thing that I hope that helps is that since I'm a teacher, uh, it'll be teacher to teacher, I'm hoping, I'm hoping that'll help also. We'll see how that goes. Uh, but really part of it is getting to a science club, I think, is kind of the way that the, our first step in. That's been our biggest impact. I mean, uh, 150 students uh, building balloons, being involved with balloons, because it's a science club. It was definitely easier to get in that way. That's right, this club sponsors the school. Now, the one thing, too, is that the Bellevue School District, since they have the science club and they've been doing this for three years, they're now ready to bring this into the classroom itself. So by, doing, by being willing to accept that it might take two or three years and working with the after-school science club might be another way to kind of get this stuff into the door. Uh, what I'm going to have to do, kind of my task now as a near space evangelist, is I need to go through the next generation science standards, NGSS, and go through those standards and say a balloon set salt is, you know, it matches this standard, this standard, this standard, this standard, and then present to the, teacher, to the teacher to say, if you need to teach this standard and this standard, do this balloon set project and you'll meet these standards. So kind of showing what standards you meet is another way to kind of get in and, and try to get the message to the, to, to the teachers to get them involved with something like that. But yes, I agree, it is, it can be tough to break in. Other questions? Mm -hmm. That's right. We would like them to write the reports and at least publish them at school. And if we get some really exceptional ones, we really want them to kind of go up and actually present them locally or nationally. But we can't do that unless they start writing with that format. The thing is, we need to find a good format for students to write their reports in. And the AIAA, since that's aeronautical and astronautical, their format should be good because we're doing a near space project, so it should match, fit right into that. So that's a good standard to, to teach the students to write in and follow that, follow that standard. But that's right, and if, if, if we've got a really good one, then we definitely would push the students to kind of present that at a, at a conference. Okay, so mm -hmm. the, uh, that's right, yeah, do something locally first and see what happens if they, can, if they can move up and do something more national. And not only that, but once you write those reports, they can get published, not just presented, but actually published. And so, but they need to start by writing that format from the very beginning. Learn. Okay, if you want, talk to me offline. I've got some kits. If you're interested in near space kits, I've got some kits to sell and to show you. And uh, please check out the website and ask other questions anytime, please. Great work, Paul. Oh, thank you. Thank you.